Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning and good afternoon uh, and good evening. Uh, wherever you are, welcome to uh, today's program. Whenever we talk about China's economy, we always do so with a complex sentence separated by a but, as in, I like ice cream, but it's bad for my health. Or more to the point, China's economy is recovering from the pandemic and maybe on maybe one of the only countries on the planet to record positive growth this year, but this is investment-led recovery and danger signs are everywhere. Or as in the case of Tom Orlick of Bloomberg in his just published book, China, the Bubble That Never Pops, which we featured in June, he reverses the order of the sentence. China faces substantial risks, but he is impressed by how well China has managed them and hence the bubble has not popped and doesn't seem like it will anytime soon, according to Tom. We need to get beyond compound sentences of good but still danger and danger but still good. Crises are not ones or zeros. They can be of different magnitudes and have varying effects, and they can germinate and grow in certain parts of the financial system on some occasions and in other parts at different times. The question is not, is there risk, but where are the risks? And the answer is not, okay, but, but rather, this is where the risks are, and these are their effects. In short, economists need to talk not like auto repair people and let you know whether or not it's safe to drive, but like doctors and diagnose short-term acute illnesses and long-term chronic diseases. You can live with both, but the kind of illness certainly affects how the patient lives. To help with this grammatical shift and career shift towards doctors diagnosing financial risks, we are blessed to have this new report by the team from the Rhodium Group, Logan Wright, Lauren Glaudemann, and Dan Rosen. This is the third report CSIS and Rhodium have collaborated on. There was the Broken Abacus, which focused on China's measurements of GDP, which came out in 2015, and Credit and Credibility, which was issued in 2018, that looked at the cracks in the credibility of the state's guarantees that there would be no crisis. Each time, uh, Dan Rosen has partnered with super smart people, in 2015, he worked with Bebe Bao, and in 2018, with Logan. And now he's working again with Logan and Lauren Glaudeman. Dan and Logan are non-resident experts in our program here, the trustee chair. Lauren is not yet, but she is a major intellectual force every day at Rhodium and in this report. Together, they have built a new economic risk matrix, an MRI machine for China's financial system. Today, Logan, Lauren, and Dan are going to present the key findings of their report and their new tool, this risk matrix, which you can find on our website, free for download, if you've not done so already. Once they've finished, about 20 to 25 minutes in, we've lined up a great team of additional financial doctors to offer special feedback on this new piece of equipment and its diagnosis. Ann Rutledge of Credit Spectrum, Ken Kong of the IMF, and Michael Taylor of Moody's Investor Service. I'll introduce them again when we get to uh, their uh, speaking slot. We also will open things up to you, the audience. You can submit questions from the event's webpage. If you've not done so, go there now and type in your question. I'll then, uh, on your behalf, ask these questions once we get to that part of the program. So now, uh, let me turn things over to the authors. We're going to start with Dan Rosen, uh, the uh, uh, founding principal of the Rhodium Group, uh, a good friend, uh, longtime collaborator uh, with me and with our program here at CSIS. Dan, uh, over to you. Scott, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here again uh, to put another contribution to public debate uh, out into circulation uh, with my colleagues uh, from Rhodium. This is a, a long time coming. A lot of work's gone in, into this. I'm just going to offer a, a couple very short thoughts to um, get it kicked off and hand it to them. First, I want to stress that 
we come not to bash China, but to praise it in important ways. Uh, it's China's extraordinary record of stability and crisis prevention that provide the justification for all the work and effort uh, that have gone into this careful yeoman-like study of the risks that come along with keeping it together uh, for so long. Uh, important um, that you noted the things we previously did. This study, Risk Matrix, is not sui generis. Uh, it builds on the previous study uh, that Logan and I did uh, together with the trustee chair, uh, Credit and Credibility. In that study, we examined why China's financial system had been so resilient for so long and how the factors that had buffered and prevented vulnerability in China were changing. And by changing, uh, giving rise to risks, which previously had been uh, uh, batted down uh, and, and kept off the, uh, the balance sheet. Uh, today's study shows how we think about going about tracking those growing risks. Uh, now that China is becoming more normal and its ability to uh, turn in a, an atypical kind of stability for such a long period of time uh, is regressing to the mean that affects the rest of us uh, in the world economy. But just before handing it over to Logan and Lauren to take us through that, let me observe that our aspiration as uh, policy thinkers um, cannot be to eliminate risk. That is impossible. And if we did so, we would eliminate the progress that comes along with risk taking um, in doing so. No, I think rather what we're looking for is the greatest tolerable risk taking consistent with society's broader interests. Well, how do we think about society's broader interests? There's no one answer to that. Different nations are gonna solve for that in different ways. But however you think about solving for that, you wanna have the most accurate gauge of the nature and level of risks in the financial system possible so that you can take more uncertainty off the table and, uh, and, and do better policy making. That's the aspiration here. And with that, let me hand it over to uh, Logan and Lauren uh, to take you through uh, what uh, they've managed to accomplish. Logan? Thank you, uh, Scott. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank all of you for, for joining us uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, if you can please go through to the third slide, please. You know, the question of whether or not China will face a financial crisis is an old one, um, and it's been around, you know, for longer than two decades now, to vary with varying degrees of seriousness applied. Uh, to that question, but opinions on this issue are are now and have been all over the map. Um, there have been many rising signs of financial stress over the years, but clearly no full blown crisis. And as Dan mentioned, um, credit and credibility. Our previous report emphasized the importance of Beijing's credibility itself in preventing these instances of financial stress from becoming a broader crisis, but. That credibility um, overall is still becoming strained as credit continues to expand relative to the size of the economy as the chart there on the, this slide highlights. Um, since 2008, you've seen $34.6 trillion in new bank asset expansion in China, which is around a third of global GDP versus only $9.5 trillion in Chinese GDP itself. We know that in that kind of financial system expansion, um, their risks are going to rise because as even Beijing says, a tree cannot grow to the sky, credit risks are going to accelerate. And you know, the purpose of this report is really to lay out a systematic approach to determine and understand where this risk is meaningful, where Beijing's credibility is changing and where, um, because, where Beijing's credibility changes, and that's likely to overwhelm uh, the tools that within Beijing's state capacity to manage overall financial risk. Can you go to the next slide, please? The problem is the set of existing tools that we have. Um, the financial system itself is you know, changing much faster than regulators' capacity to, to manage it or to even understand. Um, exactly what risks are, are brewing. And most of the tools that we use to identify financial stress are typically used for cross-country comparisons. And the problem with that, rather than something more China-specific, is that 
there's the Chinese data overall is relatively smooth. It doesn't uh, really react as much post COVID to uh, changes in um, you know, broader economic conditions. There's not much variance overall. And many of the instances of financial stress that are measured such as you know, credit, uh, credit risks or defaults you know, only have a very short history in China. So because of this data is necessarily smoother, you know, a lot of these tools that we have that most have used, you know, for cross country emerging market comparisons aren't necessarily as helpful in looking at uh, China specifically. I can go to the next slide, please. So this lays out the key principles behind um, our approach and why it's likely to be uh, different. You know, I, and I think, and Lauren will discuss this in much more, uh, in much more detail, but the key components here are that we're trying to incorporate both indicators of longer term economic vulnerability, as well as indicators of more acute short term financial stress. Um, we're trying to be diagnostic, not necessarily predictive. So I think the way to think about this is more like a flood warning system, you know, operating in multiple sectors, not a specific prediction that a particular you know, dam is going to break or something of that nature. We're also trying to explicitly be China specific. Um, we're not, we wouldn't necessarily advise using this approach um, in other contexts uh, because we've designed it particularly for uh, the Chinese financial system. And we're basically being, you know, as we would say, question driven rather than method driven. Um, you know, we're combining, you know, some unconventional methods using both deductive and inductive approaches to identify where we should see financial stress and at the same time to measure some of the indicators associated with that financial stress. The net result is what we call a China economic risk matrix, which is similar to a you know, threat matrix in security parlance. And with that, I'll hand it to Lauren to walk through um, you know, how we created this. Thank you, Logan. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna get a bit into the meat of how we constructed the risk matrix overall. Uh, just a quick note at the top here um, that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the China Specific Financial Stress Index or FSI, uh, which is one component of the overall risk matrix, but it is kind of a, a more novel um, contribution of this study. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach here uh, is defined by the challenges in which uh, we are constructing this indicator. Um, and of course, there are many. One of the earliest challenges that was brought to our attention um, uh, you know, in, in group conversations and consulting in the literature is the difference between short-term stress and longer-term building vulnerabilities. Um, and you know, in China, the examples are clear, for example, um, you might have a growing credit uh, over time, which can create a longer term vulnerability, but itself is not an instance of short term stress. Um, but when you introduce short term stress to that long term vulnerability, that can create a, a trigger. And so understanding which variables um, fall into which category is important here. Um, second, um, drawing on the literature, there are instances of both financial conditions indexes, FCIs, or often uh, also known as monetary conditions indexes and financial stress indexes. And in approaching this, we wanna understand what they're measuring. The FCIs tend to look more at macro financial linkages. That is uh, obviously the relationship between variance in a financial variable or even a macro variable and its impact on the real economy versus an FSI or financial stress index, which is looking much more explicitly at acute financial stress. And that's really more the direction that we went in um, with our FSI approach here. Um, the third challenge here that we wanna highlight is variable selection, which is uh, always a part of a process when you're creating an index like this. Um, you know, there are a lot of options for uh, how to go about this. Our approach uh, was inherently uh, subjective based on our understanding of China's financial markets. Um, but what I do want to highlight here is, first of all, the importance of funding conditions, particularly in China's interbank market. This is where China's central bank has allowed rates uh, to fluctuate more freely uh, to gauge credit demand and funding demand. Uh, 
At the same time, um, there are FX and balance of payment pressures that serve as conditions that can reduce or amplify financial stress. And so we do have a metric of uh, uh, foreign exchange volumes included here. And one thing that we intentionally de-emphasized in our variable selection, which I think differentiates our China-specific FSI from a lot of other more advanced economy uh, FSIs is that we emphasize less uh, credit spreads or credit risk indicators. Um, these are just less relevant because China has such a, such a short history of um, credit risk starting to emerge. All in all, uh, we've included 14 indicators in our FSI, um, and they're in these three buckets uh, of categories, funding rates, credit stress, and FX, uh, sorry, FX flows. Um, moving on here, um, we deal with the problem of endogeneity of financial system growth and credit growth and avoiding stress so far. Um, what that means is essentially it's a normal policy response when met with financial stress for regulators to uh, grow credit, to paper over them. And uh, in effect, uh, that response can reduce short-term financial stress, um, again, um, you know, acknowledging that an increase in credit growth alone isn't necessarily um, a risk that we want um, our FSI to register. And finally, and most importantly, um, the problem that we've grappled with, and it's really at the heart of our approach here, is what we call the dependent variable problem. Um, essentially, there is no history of financial crisis or sharp slowdown in China prior to COVID. Um, so what do we do if there is, uh, if we don't know what financial crisis look like, looks like, if we don't know what recession looks like? What is the outcome that we're looking for if, in fact, we don't know what, what it looks like? Um, this is, uh, again, really important. And we took a novel approach, which I'll explain in the next slide. Uh, but essentially, you know, typically we have variables uh, that can, whose movement can explain variation in the dependent variable. In this case, um, dependent variable is often um, an outcome variable like GDP, the effect on GDP or industrial production. Um, in our case, um, we define it as stress. Um, and go ahead to the next slide. We can get into the details here of our approach. Um, so we've taken a, a machine learning approach essentially, and this is just a visualization of our overall model. Um, all the details can be found uh, in the appendix to chapter two in the report. And so I encourage you to look there for, for more details. But essentially, you know, going back to this dependent variable problem, what does financial stress look like in the absence of an obvious crisis? So, the goal here with the FSI is to capture daily variation in financial stress within the system. Um, and we need it to work both with historical data and new data that we input into the model. Um, and I, I think big picture in some, the models that we use here are looking for similarity in how uh, variables vary in each of these instances of stress um, and then look for similarities uh, in that response throughout the entire time series. As you can see here, we've essentially done, rather than defining one dependent variable or one kind of uh, composite uh, dependent variable, what we've done is produce three dependent, intermediate dependent variables. And these are instances of financial stress that we have defined. Um, we uh, chose interbank crisis of 2013, FX stress and uh, capital outflow pressures in 2015, and deleveraging um, in 2017 to 2018. For each of these, we have uh, a model that fits uh, to predict the similarity of past instances of stress, which we told the model about um, to observe stress events. So essentially, um, we told the model that stress occurred on certain specific days, and these are what we define as uh, the dummy variables here. These are the periods of financial stress that we want to train the model and the variables on. Um, what the model does, and you know, I, I'm, I myself am not a data scientist, but I can kind of flag a couple of the techniques that really uh, hone our approach here. One is called cross-validation, um, and the goal is to achieve 
maximum predictive accuracy uh, within a set of variables. And it does that uh, by deciding the model itself chooses different regressions to control whether all variables are used uh, for understanding a certain stress event um, or whether some variables uh, should be tuned out of the model. That's to maximize kind of the explanatory nature of the variable selection in each instance. Um, and uh, so what we have here, um, these dummy variables, these three periods of stress that we feed into uh, the uh, intermediate dependent variables, um, essentially the model is able to flip a switch between the data associated with a particular stress event and data that isn't associated with the event. Um, this gives us a reading of zero to one essentially. And the readout of each data point for each day and each dependent variable uh, represents a component of the overall FSI. So we have these three dependent variables that are components. We aggregate them um, into a China specific FSI. They're equally weighted, but of course we could change that if we wanted to. And the result, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, uh, is our China FSI here. Um, and the black line obviously is the overall FSI, the components are contained within. Um, if I could just highlight a couple points here, um, unsurprisingly, uh, this is reflecting some of our choices about what variables matter and what financial stress instances matter. Um, and this is kind of, you know, a, a methodological question um, that we've grappled with, which is that we're telling the model what the periods of financial stress are. So it's not surprising, for example, that we see that the most severe stress indicated by the FSI is occurring during the interbank market of 2013, insofar as, you know, we've chosen a number of interbank funding uh, market rates as our variables, and we've told the model that one of the instances of financial stress that we should be looking for signs of throughout the time series is also the interbank market crisis. Um, but notably, as you can see here, interesting that, you know, post global financial crisis, um, financial stress, remarkably low and stable for China, uh, uh, given, you know, in fact, not so surprising, given what we know about China, China's policy response at that time. Fast forwarding to today, looking at 2020 readings, we can see already this transition from post deleveraging financial stress, which is at the end of 2018, largely. Um, to easier conditions now in early 2020 before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic spread. Uh, but already in the first half of 2020, we're seeing a, a clear um, increase in volatility um, due to China's policy response. Um, now, that being said, the level uh, in 2020 so far is comparatively low. Um, but we know that there's additional stress within the non-bank financial sector that has materialized. And if you'll go to the next slide, we can get into um, the other uh, risk matrix components outside of the FSI. These are areas where vulnerabilities are testing Beijing state capacity, just as Logan described earlier. In the report itself, there's a lengthy discussion of the tools that Beijing has to contain financial stress um, the types of markets where those tools are less effective. And that really informs um, our uh, selection here, not just of these different risks, but also the, the variables contained within. Um, and so we encourage you to, to refer to the report there. But just to summarize here, um, we have uh, an additional indicator for property market conditions, which we consider one of the most financial asset, most important financial asset markets in China, not just because of the massive level of participation, but also because should prices start to fall sharply, Beijing has little control. Um, second, banks and bank funding conditions. Banks are dominant in China's financial system, um, but we uh, have not seen uh, the defaults uh, at the level that we're seeing now, including post Baoshang Bank in May 2019, and credit risks will continue to accumulate within banks. Um, so it's important to monitor Third, debt and credit risks. Um, credit has continued to expand rapidly, um, but we're seeing more loans, bonds, and shadow financing instruments start to default. Um, and so Beijing is going to be forced to react uh, to protect certain financial institutions. And that, you know, making that choice is another indication of how to think about risk. Uh, 
uh, fourth, external pressure. Um, you know, sharp movements and external monetary conditions can, tr can trigger um, capital outflows, currency depreciation uh, within China and affect domestic liquidity conditions. So this is an extremely important uh, area to monitor. And fifth, openness to capital flows. On the one hand, uh, you know, foreign investors around the world are rooting for greater openness um, and access to China's capital markets. But at the same time, that openness can transmit financial stress across China's borders. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, before I turn it back to Logan, let's look at what it all uh, comes together. Um, uh, this is, you know, just one way of looking at the combination of all of our ind indexes here um, together with the FSI. Um, and there's a lot to take in, a lot to see here, um, but um, you know, what I can point to, just reiterating the, the point that Logan made earlier, that you know, this isn't about having a threshold that tells us you know, yes or no, is a crisis happening, is a crisis coming? This is more like a flood war warning system that allows us to monitor multiple sectors at a certain time. And so if we can see uh, vulnerabilities rising as we as we see now um, in certain sectors that we're monitoring at the same time we're looking for instances of acute financial stress this will allow us to kind of keep a a, a, a wide uh, multifaceted uh, watch on how different risks within China's economy are changing over time uh, and building um, at any given moment um, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Logan, uh, to talk about uh, financial stress. Thanks, Laura. The, the next slide and the next one after that, please. So now that you've seen how we assembled uh, this, the risk matrix, um, you know, we want to show how we use it and how we've applied it to recent periods of, of, of history in, in China where there has been financial stress underway. Um, you know, the most acute period under our, our uh, financial stress index was the June 2013 interbank market crisis. And this was a time when um, basically the PBOC was trying to squeeze out shadow banking activity within uh, the within financial markets, and it ended up producing an overreaction where short term funding rates rose above 20%. Very quickly, there were no lenders in the market. I would argue it's probably the closest that China has come to a layman moment uh, where systemic stability was threatened. What's interesting about the risk matrix readings, of course, is that even though capital outflows were underway at the time because of the Fed's taper tantrum, financial stress was rising. Other indicators weren't that acute. The property sector was fairly well behaved. Same with the banking sector. If you can go to the next slide, please. And compare that to what was happening in uh, 2015 and 2016 following the shock August 2015 UN depreciation um, that occurred and how to view that through uh, the risk matrix perspective. You saw first an intensification of capital outflows that really lasted all the way through late 2016, but the, the strongest period of those was uh, from August 2015 to February uh, 2016. And that did strain domestic liquidity conditions. Um, the PBOC had to ease monetary policy in response. Uh, that threat was real, but Banks were actually benefiting from the decline in rates at the time in terms of the PBOC's response. And the property market actually benefited from a rotation of assets out of stocks and into property. So you didn't have this combination of effects that could potentially be more threatening um, to systemic stability. The next slide, please. Um, and that sort of brings us to, you know, closer to where we are in the present day, which was what happened with the deleveraging campaign and particularly the, the default of, of Baoshang Bank. The deleveraging campaign, as we call it um, in China, that started in late 2016 was a combination of both uh, monetary and regulatory tightening steps to control the shadow banking system and to reduce risk on both the funding side and the asset side of banks' uh, balance sheets. And the shadow banking system was simply larger than Beijing knew at the time. So the net result of deleveraging was a really significant slowdown in overall credit growth. Uh, credit growth averaged 18% from 2007 to 2016, and it's only averaged about 8% from 2017 to 20, 2019. 
And that slowdown in credit has finally spilled into solvency risks for banks themselves. Um, on, in May 2019, uh, Baosheng Bank was suddenly seized uh, by, the, by financial regulators. And that created the first bank failure in China in over 20 years. And the first time that you had real solvency risk that needed to be priced among uh, traders and counterparties. You actually could lose money by investing in a Chinese bank by uh, depositing money in a Chinese bank. And this was happening at the same time, as you can see on the risk matrix, is when external pressure from the trade war was building, when uh, property sector risks were rising. You know, 2019 was really a watershed year for credit risk in China, and the consequences of that are still developing. Can we go to the next slide, please? There's a, a cover slide and then one more. Sorry, can we go to the next slides, please? Um, if not, I can just continue. Um, I, just, I was worried I was cut off there. There we go. Um, so, you know, obviously, I think the key question becomes uh, where are we now? Uh, what do the conditions look like um, as we approach the, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak and the response? Um, you know, and our answer, of course, as we've sort of alluded to, is that, yes, China's return to growth, just as, as Scott mentioned, um, and how they return to growth is the same process whereby you've created some of the uh, financial risks that have been developing. And as you see on, you know, our readings on the risk matrix right now, um, we're seeing risks rising across multiple uh, metrics that have been exacerbated by the slowdown in nominal GDP growth that's occurred earlier in the year. Uh, deflation area pressure has been rising, real financing costs are therefore rising, and the property sector in particular um, is under pressure, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Obviously, China's external environment is not as conducive to growth as, uh, as, as it has been before, in part because of the political realignment, but um, there has been a record current account surplus. Um, exports are being, or you know, near record current account surplus. Exports are far more resilient, so we haven't quite seen the, those sort of metrics of stress um, improve. Metrics of stress uh, materialize. Can you go to the next slide, please. But you can see the overall climate of risks that we see um, building. You know. Property in particular is likely to strain Beijing's capacity to respond given the extreme supply demand imbalances within the market. You have a situation where property starts, um, new construction is running at uh, basically at all time highs. All time highs were in 2019, and we've only barely come down from those levels. Against that, uh, demographic changes are dramatically reducing new household formation. A stat we like to point out is that. You know, you only have 163.3 million Chinese 11 to 20 year olds um, at this point. And if you assume 70% of them eventually acquire urban hukou, which is probably uh, urban residency permits, which is probably a, an aggressive assumption, and roughly 80% of them form uh, households or enter the property market, um, then the current pace of property construction is around three times the, the pace of household formation. Uh, in other words, China's building the next decade of housing uh, demand in roughly the next three years um, at its current pace. And so the, the concern now is that tightening measures that are placed on the property sector are identified in that kind of uh, demand supply imbalance, falling prices that'll make it more difficult for uh, Beijing to respond. The other risk I would flag is what we call, you know, it's a very China specific form of risk, which is what we call geographic counterparty risk. This is where local government capacity uh, to guarantee its SOEs, to guarantee uh, state-owned enterprises, to guarantee local government financing vehicles and other enterprises is now in question. And so even where you have high quality companies in certain localities, they can't necessarily fund themselves uh, with traders or investors in the market. The last slide, please. And the report itself has, you know, lengthy discussions of the implications of this. So I'll just summarize a few of them here. Um, the most important is really, I think, the reframing the date around China's economic future. 
um, you know, there should be contingency plans, we would argue, around uh, a slowdown and a potential crisis. But it's also important for like-minded market democratic systems not to indirectly support the narrative that China's rise is inexorable. You know, wherever you are within the policy debate um, on China, whether you're you know, hawkish or more uh, inclined toward nudging China toward reform, you would benefit from a more realistic view of the risks that are ahead. Uh, hawks because it conveys the impact that pressure can create and reformers because it didn't realize it demonstrates the pressure that Beijing is under uh, to respond and change course. But you know, the challenge, the other point to remember here is that the challenge from China's policy choices isn't going away, even if there is going to be a sharper slowdown in growth or the potential for greater financial stress. Um, and it's still going to require a more aggressive, uh, more aggressive response. There's much more in uh, the report itself, and I hope those interested will take a read, uh, but I will stop there and hand it over to our commentators. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dan, Logan, and Lauren, uh, for a terrific report and a tidy summation of, of, of how you put together the risk matrix and how it's applied. Uh, I, uh, really a, a big step forward in, in our understanding of China's financial system, uh, the risks uh, that, that lurk within it. Luckily, we, are, we have three leading experts on China's uh, financial system and the economy to offer some initial feedback and thoughts uh, on this uh, financial doctors in their own right. Uh, we have Ann Rutledge, who's founding principal of Credit Spectrum. She joined us in June when we discussed Tom Orlick's book. Uh, she has a long distinguished career co covering credit risk issues in Asia and China, including spending a considerable amount of time in Hong Kong, helping the monetary authorities understand credit risks. Ken Kong is deputy director of the Asia and Pacific Department of the IMF. He covers uh, Northeast Asia. That's just a small group of countries, China, Hong Kong, Korea, and Mongolia. Uh, the SAR of Hong Kong, of course, not the uh, country. Uh, he's covered a range of individual countries before, including Italy, Japan, and the Netherlands. And he served as the IMF's represent, resident representative in Korea from 2003 to 2006. Michael Taylor, who is joining us from Singapore, is managing director for Moody's Investors Service, so Moody's chief credit officer for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, he previously served at the Bank of England, the IMF, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and the Central Bank of Bahrain, among other posts. Each will offer about seven to eight minutes max of comments and reflections. And then uh, we will continue on with the conversation uh, after they conclude. So let me turn things over first uh, to Ann Rutledge. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Scott. And I want to say, first of all, I'm very, very grateful to Scott, Dan, Logan, Lauren, CSIS and the Rhodian Group for the opportunity to comment on what I think is really a pioneering paper. Um, the second thing I want to, to caveat is this is potentially a vast topic of which I really only have two possibly intelligent comments to contribute from my corner of predictive credit analytics and, and securitization. But when I think deeply, uh, both of my remarks are related to the problem that has been so expertly addressed with this paper, and that is the age-old problem of solving one equation with two unknowns, right? So what causes a crisis and what is a crisis on both sides of the equation? Um, as the authors state, you know, straightforwardly, they're challenged by the fact that the dependent variable, financial system or economic disruption, has been dampened relative to what we would consider to be a more true measure. We posit that it exists, but it's elusive. We don't actually know what it is because we are coming at China's system from the framework of our own system, which is not perfect either, which has suffered five crises, large crises since 1984, um, and the causes of those have not properly been deconstructed. Um, so that is the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, is the solution uh, to this problem. And the second is to talk about my market securitization, which is a very large market in China now. It caused a great deal of distress in the last major crisis. Um, and it is similarly hindered, hindered by the problem of one equation with two unknowns. Um, so I may not get 
solution um, that involves um, the, analysis, the analysis of potentially contributor, contributing variables to the problem of crisis. Um, what I see it as uh, is a capital structure index. So um, when I approached the paper first, coming from my work in credit scoring, where the challenges are to describe payment behavior causally rather than, you know, and avoiding curve fitting, I was um, interested in the fact that there were so many variables. A typical credit score has between three and seven variables. In theory, this is what you would like to, to have, but when you're risk scoring the entire Chinese economy, you're looking at, at a body, as Scott said, it, it's something that is in need of an MRI. Um, the authors make a very good case for the variables that they use. And in reality, what they've created is a capital structure score with uh, um, aspects of debt, equity, the, lever the degree of leverage, points on a yield curve, and non-bank capital, real estate, which is a major source of capital um, in the Chinese economy. Without looking too deeply into the machine learning algo, I would also say that the method of aggregation makes sense given the challenge of correlated variables. The weighted sum, PCA, and other, uh, other ways of aggregating the, the variables that they considered have their own limitations. The scenario construction and linkage of the variables to the scenarios, it makes sense to me, and I think the figures are absolutely stunning. Um, if you go back and read the paper, the risk indices are very clear. The risk matrix industry indices in figure four are amazing. Um, the snapshots of the risk matrix under stress is very, very explanatory. I have a lot more to say on that, but um, let me turn to the one piece that I would have liked to have seen in the analysis, and that is securitization. So securitization does not really fit comfortably into the categories banking sector or shadow banking. To somebody who's not in the markets, it may appear to be one or the other because banks are arrangers and it's shadow banks that do the issuance. Um, but, but this is not actually how securitization works. In May of 2020, securitization was a 103 trillion RMB market, much of which is in China's interbank market. So it's certainly in the sweet spot of of the structures and the flows that, are, that this risk metrics uh, risk matrix is is investigating. Um, most of it is domestic. This is a domestic market, but foreign investors now uh, represent, on average, twenty to thirty percent of the auto paper, and sometimes up to forty and fifty percent. Um, the key point is that securitization is not shadow banking, although um, it, it what it is is it's a linking of future receivables to a scale of performance. In that sense, it's, it's called monetization for a reason because it's, it's money. Um, when I look at China's securitization market, it makes me nervous because by comparison with the Western model, it has a lot of counterparty support. In our model, it's supposed to be an off balance sheet market, um, but a lot of the support comes in the Chinese context from counterparties. This may feed into later comments, but um, what I want to say that is very different is in terms of issuance norms, this is an over enhanced market relative to the US and European markets. When I say over enhanced, I mean it's safer in capital terms than what we look at. It's less levered. Um, if you just look at the sizes and the ratings, you can see this. I would not be surprised if many of the off balance sheet exposures were more prudentially capitalized than many of China's banks, in fact. Um, and the reason I say that is because when you look at the balance sheets of banks and you look at the disclosures on defaults, the, from a securitization standpoint, the techniques of analyzing defaults reveal that the on balance sheet loans are, are much less well capitalized. It doesn't mean that every deal in China's securitization market is safe, but it does speak to a potential cushion in the financial system that we're not calculating. On the other hand, the dependence of institutions, banking institutions and non-bank institutions on securitization for liquidity is not being monitored as closely as it can be. We all know that this year securitization levels are down. And so one could expect that there could be liquidity prices that might not be fully fully anticipated um, in the risk structure that's been created here. 
Another point I want to say is that there's a lot of experimentation taking place right now with China's securitization market. It's been rolled out to short-term markets to address the supply chain. It's being rolled out to the, um, the, the six special zones um, for creating REITs that are backed by infrastructure projects. These are, these are very different uses, although the technology may be similar. Um, and I think that the differences as, as China's securitization market continues to separate from the model that we know, it's an imperative to study the sector simply because it is utilizing capital in a different way and because potentially it is creating money in a different way. So an interesting sort of follow on look might be to consider securitization in connection with cryptocurrencies since they're both alternative forms of money. So that is to me the, the, the real problem that, that we're all facing when we try to create analytics around performance so that we can anticipate future risk um, is that, that we all have uh, one equation with two unknowns. The value of a currency itself is ultimately related to the capacity of the real economy to create yield sustainably. And that's driven by the left side of the balance sheet. This is a challenge that, that we both need to address, but the paper is a very good start. Super, thanks so much, Ann. Uh, Ken, over to you. Hey, thanks. So let me also thank Scott and the organizers at CSIS for inviting me and to Logan, Lauren, and Daniel for putting together a, a terrific book. I mean, as a follow-up to their credit and credibility report, I think the authors have done an excellent job and great service in educating us about the China's financial system. And I, I know that I personally have benefited a lot from, from their work. Um, let me begin my comments by highlighting, highlighting what I like and what is important in their report, and then talk about how one can think about the risks and challenges facing China's financial system using their economic risk matrix. I always need to begin by saying my comments are my own and should not be attributed to, to the IMF. Uh, in reading over the report, three ideas or expressions came to mind. First is, you know it when you see it. Second, as Logan mentioned in his presentation, playing the game whack-a-mole. And third is the danger of fighting the last war. First on, you know it when you see it, as the authors point out, identifying risks, let alone predicting a crisis is inherently difficult when you have not seen one before and given the special characteristics of the system. Nonetheless, it is useful to think through possible scenarios, triggers, and policy responses, what the authors call a security or a flood warning exercise. What I like about the report is, is how it examines previous stress events, the reactions by market participants and policymakers, and the lessons one can take for future events. In particular, I like the new elements, such as the introduction of geographic counterparty risk, reflecting the different financial health of local governments and the implications for banks and corporates operating in these jurisdictions. This reminded me of the situation in the Euro area before the sovereign debt crisis, when growing imbalances and long known flaws in the currency union were exposed during the GFC and how the intersection of financial and political economy constraints delayed a policy response. As the authors note, even though Baoshan Bank was a mid-sized bank with an asset size of about 80 billion US dollars before its failure, if you can call that a mid-size, it had a significant exposure to the interbank market and was a large bank in the Inner Mongolia province, making it difficult to find another local bank to partner and rescue Baoshan. This new counterparty risk is certainly worth following closely as it has implications also for the functioning of China's internal market and the relationship between the center and its provinces. I also appreciate very much the close focus on the property market where we have seen not just in Asia, but around the world, its potential as a source and amplifier of financial shocks, as well as the difficulties in addressing housing risks, both economically and politically. This leads me to my second point on the parallels to playing the game of, of whack-a-mole. For those who have not had the pleasure, whack-a-mole is an addictive game where many of us perhaps played at a boardwalk arcade where you are faced with a wooden board with a lot of holes, you need to use a hammer to whack down a, a small animal, a mole, as it raises its head above the ground. The holes are in different places, but the animal looks the same and rarely appears twice in a row. Like whack-a-mole, you don't know where and when financial risks will emerge. 
but they often rise up in the form of excessive leverage and risk taking. In this regard, I, I think it's important to view the financial stress indices in the risk matrix in their proper context. Monitoring is good, but the right interpretation requires an understanding of the setting. Here, the estimation of the risk matrix should probably follow what we call in economics a Bayesian approach, where one updates the probability of an event using past as well as current information as it becomes available. I think the report's attempt to track emerging risks in the property market is a good example here and should continue and evolve as new signs of excessive leverage and risk-taking emerge. This leads me to my, my third point uh, on the dangers of fighting the last war. Um, the report focuses on the credibility of the policymaker, but in a financial system that is trying to become more market-based, what will become more important is the credibility of the policy framework. That is the rules and regulations that govern market behavior of participants and the policymaker. Ideally, you want a system that is primarily rules-based, predictable, and with sufficient buffers so that participants can price risk appropriately and react in an orderly and efficient way. In this way, the economic risk matrix could help monitor progress in strengthening the policy frameworks and to what extent market participants are behaving according to the new rules and incentives. For an exercise like the ERM, this is important because it may not be clear whether an increase in financial stress is because of a building vulnerability, a loss of policy credibility, or the intended policy outcome to de-risk and allow a greater role for the markets. In this regard, the Chinese authorities have undertaken a number of important reforms over the years to modernize the regulatory frameworks, such as through the CBIRC, the crackdown on shadow banking, and now a further opening up of the financial sector. But much more work needs to be done, especially in restructuring the weak, small, and mid-sized banks and addressing the legacy and emerging NPL issues. So seeing more defaults, more volatility, higher risk spreads that resemble those of other financial systems, in this sense, may be a positive sign if done in an orderly way and supported by deeper reforms. At the IMF, we conduct what's called an FSAP, a Financial Sector Assessment Program, a sort of financial health checkup that assesses the robustness of the framework, rules, and, and regulations, including for China in 2017. I see the economic risk matrix as a nice complement in monitoring emerging risks, as well as drawing attention to the policy gaps along the course of China's financial development. This leads me to my, my final point, that one needs to take a holistic view in considering the risks in China's financial system, combining the macro, financial, and the political economy, the health of the banks, the corporates, and the households, and now the local governments, the short-term cyclical position and longer-term growth prospects from aging and an uncertain external environment, as well as the new regulatory reforms in financial opening up. I'm guessing the authors will be very busy incorporating these new developments into the evolving risk matrix, and I wish them the best of luck. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ken. Uh, terrific. Let's turn uh, to Michael now, who has uh, a few slides to accompany his remarks. Welcome uh, from Singapore, Michael. Thank you very much, Scott, and, and thank you to the CSIS for the invitation to, to take part in this fascinating conversation. And again, I'd like to add my congratulations to, to those of the uh, other discussants, to, uh, to Lauren, Logan, and Dan, for, for what is really a fascinating paper. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on a slightly different set of topics to the ones that Anne and, and Ken have already covered. Uh, and I'm going to jump to the conclusions of the report. Um, I hope it's not jumping to a conclusion, but I'm going to jump to, to some to the conclusions that were reached. And I think it comes back to this issue of, if we're talking about a financial crisis in China, what exactly is it that we're talking about? Uh, and there have been, over the past years, many predictions of a potential financial crisis, an impending financial crisis in China. And often they arise, those predictions are made on the basis 
that we take economic models or, or financial sector models, which are not necessarily applicable in the case of China. And it's important to understand where, where things in, in China differ from those of uh, the rest of the world. And in particular, I think from emerging markets. I mean, there, there is also still a very much a tendency to analyze China in terms of the, the tools of analysis that we've developed over the years for emerging markets. And I think one of the big questions really is how applicable are those tools in the case of, of a system like China's. Now, just moving to the next slide, please. This is um, basically a schematic that we developed several years ago, actually, to, to try to think about if we were looking at a genuine systemic risk in China, what would it look like and what would be the transmission channels? And it, it's easy to talk about a financial crisis, but I would only really consider a financial sector problem to be systemic if it went to the core of the payment system. Uh, and I think that's one of the questions. I mean, you can identify areas of potential financial stress, but do they actually constitute a potential systemic crisis? Would they go to the core of the payment system? And I think in China's case, the answer in most cases is no. Um, let's start at the top here in terms of the, and, and this was um, an argument that you heard very often in 2015 you heard it again when the regulatory windstorm began around the shadow banking system in 2017. So, you know, there are certainly risks there. I wouldn't like to minimize them. They're high leverage, uh, and we've seen a very significant rise in leverage in China, especially in the post-global financial crisis period. We've had a very rapid expansion of shadow banking, uh, and now more recently issues around regional banks' asset quality. So you can identify each of those as a potential source of systemic risk. Now, the question is, could China experience a financial crisis in the sense that it is a, an impairment to the core payment system? Well, I think to get to that point, you would really have to think in terms of rapid financial liberalization, uh, an opening of the capital account in a disorderly manner, um, which would weaken the authorities' ability to manage risks. And I think since the, the authorities recognize that that is a risk, and since they recognize that they would have a problem if they moved rapidly to open the capital account, it's something that we're very unlikely to see. And when the renminbi was added to the SDR basket a few years back, there were some analysts in the investment banking community who were talking about a rapid move towards a freely floating renminbi. Um, talk which I have always considered to be vastly premature. So if we avoid capital account opening as uh, in a rapid or disorderly manner, there are some buffers there, there are protections there, um, particularly in terms of much of the, the debt is, is domestic. Um, again, that is a big contrast with your standard emerging market story. Um, as the Rhodium team have talked about in their previous report, credit and credit credibility, the role of implicit or explicit state backing. There's still, despite the, the rise in um, the uh, government's uh, borrowings, there is still quite a lot of fiscal space left. And then, of course, you still have the closed capital account. And after the 2015 and 2016 episode, uh, we saw a, a significant intensification of capital controls, which have been effective. So again, we, we get to the point where at this point, it doesn't look like you could get to a genuinely systemic crisis. So could you avoid um, problems, financial instability in the longer term? And there I think you'd have to think in terms of other drivers of economic growth that do not rely to the same extent that we've seen in the past on the growth of credit. If China can establish those, then again, the leverage ratio can be brought down over a period of time through growth. And I think I agree that one of the issues that we're now facing is that with coronavirus and the impact of, of coronavirus, we may be looking at a structurally lower growth path going forward, and that may well impair China's ability to grow its way out of the very high levels of debt that have been accumulated. 
And in that sort of situation, you end up with a final box on this schematic, which is a slow burn scenario. So you have a long period of subpar economic growth, unrecognized losses, the gradual erosion of credit quality. It isn't a systemic crisis, but it is one in which there is a gradual erosion of credit quality over time. So that seems to me to be the most plausible outcome. Either you, you see uh, a situation where China manages to find new drivers of economic growth that are less dependent on credit. And we see from the development of the, uh, particularly in terms of the, the e-commerce sector, which has grown very rapidly uh, and which is less credit dependent than traditional industries that have been certainly a major driver of growth. So I think that there, there are various kinds of mitigants there. And if we move just uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go very, very quickly through the remaining slides. If we could move to the next slide. In terms of the shadow banking risks, which a few years ago, going back to 2015, 2016, these, uh, this was where the financial crisis was supposed to begin. Well, the regulatory actions that the Chinese government has taken have been very, very effective. As you can see, shadow banking as a percentage of GDP has shrunk very significantly as a result of the regulatory windstorm. Uh, it has, as uh, Logan and Lauren pointed out, had uh, an impact in terms of the availability of credit. And we, we did see uh, a period of um, limited credit availability, um, during the, especially during the 2018 period. But again, the, the idea that shadow banking was going to represent a systemic vulnerability, I think has largely now been removed by the very effective regulatory crackdown that we've seen. And moving on to the next slide, the interconnectedness between banks and shallow banks has been significantly reduced. So moving to the next slide, the real risk I think in the near term is from the expansion of small regional banks. And we've heard already about the Baosheng episode. Uh, there is a small group of regional banks, which have grown incredibly rapidly over the last few years, and those are the ones that are most at risk. But again, uh, sorry, if we move on to the next slide, um, and again, I think the uh, focus that um, the report makes on the importance of the interbank market is, is well made, in that these smaller banks are very much more dependent on interbank funding uh, than the, the large uh, state-owned banks. So that is clearly an area of vulnerability. And we saw in the immediate aftermath of Baosheng that there was some disruption to the interbank market. Now moving on to the next slide, and the asset quality in these smaller banks is very much weaker than the rest of the financial system. Rural commercial banks being particularly weak, city commercial banks also being weak. And it's the city commercial banks, some of the city commercial banks, which have been the fastest growing components of the system. But then you have to come back to this question, is it a systemic risk? I think that given the relative sizes of these institutions and given the fact, even taking into um, account the point that Ken made about the regional or provincial importance of certain institutions, in comparison to the overall financial system, they are comparatively small. If we were looking at a problem in this sector, it is more akin, I would argue, to the savings and loan problems in the US in the mid 80s than it is to the kind of systemic crisis we saw in Asia in 97, 98. So it comes back to, do, is China really at risk of the systemic crisis? And I would argue it is very difficult still to get to the point where you could see a systemic crisis on the scale where you would see an imp impairment of the core payment system without some major dismantling of the capital controls regime that China has in place. And I don't see that happening in the near term because the authorities are well aware of that risk. So overall, I, there, there are certainly risks and vulnerabilities in China's financial system, but I don't see them constituting the level of um, a systemic risk. So with that, I'll hand back to Scott. Terrific. Thank you, Michael. And, and thank you, Ken and uh, Anne, as well, for your comments. Um, I, when we put this event together, uh, I was too ambitious in thinking that we could squeeze this very complex topic, even though it's been nicely summarized in the matrix and the feedback in 75 minutes. And, and so I'm going to uh, 
uh, use my executive privilege to suggest that we go a few minutes longer uh, because the, the, we've uh, uh, uncorked a very rich discussion and I don't wanna just chop it off. Uh, we've got folks dialing in from around the world and we just really wanna make sure that we at a minimum touch upon uh, the, some of the, the issues raised. So what I wanna do now uh, first is turn it back to the, the authors and give you a chance to react uh, very briefly to the comments from uh, the commentators. And then I've received uh, suggest uh, questions uh, sent to us by audience members. And uh, there's sort of two kinds. One has to do with sort of domestic financial issues and one are about international issues. So, uh, and then I'll invite everyone uh, to, to offer feedback on those two things. But let me give the authors a chance now to have initial reactions to the comments from Ann, Ken, and Michael. Um, thanks, Scott, and thanks to Ann, Ken, and Michael for, um, for your very thoughtful comments. Um, I, I, it's hard to pick out what to respond to here. So I'll just say, um, you know, a few things, a few things here and there. Um, in terms of the security, in terms of the securitization issue, um, and I completely agree with you. This is an understudied and underappreciated aspect of the financial system. That right now, it's not that we even did consider it, but we didn't consider it as sort of a separate area of data analysis, so to speak. And in part, this is a, a data availability problem um, in terms of how quickly the asset-backed securities market, particularly in consumer credit. Um, has emerged in China and has been facilitated by some of the internet platforms. So, you know, I would expect that um, there is going to, we're going to, when more data becomes available, we're going to find a lot more uh, robust um, and interesting insights from what's been happening in terms of the creation of money and credit. Um, from uh, asset-backed securities in particular within China. And I'm very interested in your insight that you think this is basically better supported, better capitalized uh, than uh, the shadow banking system, than, um, than the banking system itself in some ways. And uh, because of the cash flow streams behind this. What's interesting to me about many of the, 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 the aspects of the social credit system and consumer credit extension, just thinking out loud, is that there's not, not a macro development around, there's often not a macro framing around them. People assume they have great insight into credit risk because they have more micro insight into borrowers behavior, but that's on a very limited timeline and it doesn't necessarily justify a, a huge expansion of credit um, or you can't really know where that meets uh, financial deepening, uh, the limits of financial deepening overall. Um, in, in terms of uh, Ken's comment about um, financial stress and the regulatory frameworks uh, that have been put in place, it sort of dovetails with uh, Michael's comments about uh, the resiliency of, of the regulatory approach to shadow banking. Um, in, in addition, we completely, uh, we completely agree that there have been, I mean, we think the deleveraging campaign is a, a sea change moment in terms of the operation of the Chinese financial system. Um, we just think it had a much larger impact on aggregate credit, um, and that is that impact is still filtering through into the macroeconomy and financial stability, uh, especially in the corporate credit space. Because while the deleveraging campaign went on, you also had a huge expansion of credit to uh, households at the same time as corporate credit was squeezed uh, more substantially. So uh, Ken's insight, I think, on needing to understand how um, actors in the system are reacting to new policy frameworks and whether stress is a result of something essentially, often financial stress in China is the result of some policy change that's actually intended, um, but it's often you know, exceeds that threshold that was intended, um, that policy measures tend to be more blunt and you tend to create an overreaction one direction. And that's sort of, you know, leads to two different views on financial stability. Um, those that are in the more bearish camp will say that that just shows their tools are blunt, the system's too fragile, and it's going to break. And those that are in the more constructive or, you know, often in the policymaking community are saying, that's how policymaking tools work. And they're going to produce overreactions in some direction. And you take a little bit of an overreaction if their net result is to reduce systemic vulnerability. And I think that debate is, is going to, to remain active in China. I, I've found it um, operable for the last 10 years at least, um, and it's going to remain active uh, for much longer than that. Uh, and just briefly on Michael's comments, um, 
you know, I, I think that the, you know, what we're focusing on in the, we, we talked a lot about what the, the prospect of a systemic financial crisis um, within credit and credibility to a greater extent than even within this report with reference to China's capital account liberalization, the fact that debt was internally held rather than external. Um, the point we would make, I think, in, in response is that there's been just a huge endogeneity between uh, credit growth and overall economic expansion, particularly given the level of debt that is out there managed by local governments and not recognized. And therefore, it's very difficult, I think, to have a pivot to a different uh, engine of growth without a much sharper correction or the evidence of financial stress that will materialize because of that. And I think one of the points we try to make, not only in credit credibility, but here, is that there's this tension between the reform of the financial system and financial stability itself. Beijing has basically benefited because everyone assumes that domestic financial assets are guaranteed. But if those financial, domestic financial assets, uh, if Beijing backs away from those guarantees, then that creates new risks that need to be priced. And that's exactly what we're seeing with counterparty solvency risk in the banking system. And we would just argue that that group of banks that's in trouble is a bit larger than a handful. Um, you know, it's, it's much more, uh, not just those that are relying upon um, interbank financing, but as you know, the PBOC only extends direct loans to 46 banks. If those interbank funding chains start to break down, whether along geographic counterparty lines or as we saw in, Baosh, in the immediate aftermath of Baoshang on other, for other reasons, we've already seen five relatively major banks restructured, several other smaller banks um, at the same time. Uh, we can see more of that stress intensify. Let me stop there and um, Lauren, if you want to go ahead and respond as well. Thank you. I, I would only add that, you know, this has already um, generated some ideas for thinking about future iterations of the risk matrix, um, not just in terms of variables for inclusion, but, you know, obviously uh, as the model stands now, we're talking about whether um, future uh, data points uh, look like past um, data points. And so um, thinking about how to keep the FSI and broader risk matrix constantly evolving um, in terms of those future risks is something that, uh, you know, look forward to engaging with uh, everyone on that going forward. Thank you. Terrific, um, super. Um, if, uh, let, let me put forward now a few questions that came in from the audience uh, and, and welcome uh, responses from both uh, the authors and the, the commentators. The first are about uh, sort of domestic issues, the second about um, international things. Let, 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 why don't I actually just touch upon both sets of questions and then let you all uh, respond to those that, that you most want to uh, in the interest of, of time. So the first around domestic questions, sort of the three that questions that cohere, uh, hopefully they cohere. The first um, is, you know, for those that work uh, in, in, in Western free market-based institutions uh, or who analyze those institutions, uh, and now they are, and it, it, it's credit risk uh, and financial risk situation. What's the, you know, one biggest difference uh, that, that they need to do? What habit do they need to give up? What new habit do they need to have to properly uh, understand China's risk matrix as opposed to when they look uh, back at home? So what do you all highlight here that you wouldn't highlight in developing a similar type of parallel matrix for the United States or as Ken discussed in Europe pre-global financial crisis? Relatedly, um, if you, you, the conversations about China's long-term growth touch a lot upon uh, the need to increase uh, domestic consumption by households, that, that they, China needs to move away from investment-driven growth that's state-directed where you don't get a lot of productivity gains, and they need to increase consumption from households on services and many other things. Part of doing that would require, uh, from some economists' point of view, uh, a significant transfer of wealth from uh, the state or from, from corporates uh, to households uh, through tax policy, other types of policies, so that 
consumers actually had more wealth uh, to consume with. If consumption jumps, if you make these types of changes, where would that show up in the matrix? Where would you see the new risks uh, emerge uh, if China moves in the direction which many say it needs to achieve uh, longer term uh, sustainable growth? Last question. Uh, is about the where the index looks right now uh, post uh, COVID, which is you see five indices relatively high, you see the FSI pretty low. Why is that? Uh, international questions. Um, uh, Belt and Road, uh, Chinese overseas investment. Um, what's the effect on China's domestic financial stress? How would we we see that? China can China right now has been receding in the amount of capital outflows as uh, rhodium shows in its other other work, but might not stay that way. So how does Belt Road or other outward Chinese foreign investment or greater role uh, in capital markets beyond China affect how the, the what the matrix would look like? Uh, and then lastly, uh, how does financial stress in other places uh, in Europe, in the United States potentially, reflect back on China. Can you have a full, can you fully understand China's financial risk matrix without understanding the risk matrices of other countries uh, that are large financial players in the global economy? Why don't I first turn to the authors to get your reactions to either set the questions and also in, invite the commentators as, as well to, to chime in. Uh, thanks, Scott, and I'll I'll just address sort of the domestic issues. I think, which probably makes sense, understanding the uh, variance of you know understanding of how many topics there are to to cover here. Um, on the question of you know what's the biggest difference between China's risk matrix and those in other uh, developed economies, um, the short answer I, I would say there's two answers. One is that uh, China doesn't have this long history of credit risk. Um, and default risk. And so therefore it's difficult to know what pricing metrics in terms of credit risk in China really mean for financial stress relative to what we know about what those mean in other developed economies. But the bigger issue I would say is that look at the expansion of China's bank assets, overall financial assets relative to the markets in which they are priced. And I think the, the biggest distinction is that there's this huge expansion of assets overall without um, you know, liquid markets in which they can be readily priced, which would help, help us to under would help us to understand how out of line uh, those asset prices might be, and that would be one key distinction. On the consumption question, I mean, I think there's really no question that China is going to need some form of a consumption stimulus um, in the in the coming uh, you know quarters and years, and that probably involves some degree of transfer of assets from the state in some respect. Um, how that's done is, is more difficult because China only charges a little bit more than um, one per, you know, a little bit more than 1% uh, uh, of GDP and in income tax. So you can't really use the same sort of counter cyclical uh, policy responses as, as before. But in terms of what, where a jump in consumption might show up within the risk matrix, my guess would be it would show up in terms of a rise in credit and banking sector risk because of non-performing assets from the corporate side. Uh, because presumably, you know, the, the overall pace of credit growth is right now constrained by capital requirements uh, from banks. And um, therefore, if you see this improvement in overall consumption growth and redirection of credit toward the consumer, you'll probably see a squeeze on corporate credit, which is sort of what we saw in the 2017-2018 timeframe. Um, other indication is uh, five of the indices right now are, are high and the financial stress index is low. Uh, the short answer is because vulnerabilities can be rising without obvious stress. And that's exactly a, a, a dynamic that I think we are seeing right now. Um, we're a lot more concerned about what's happening in terms of vulnerabilities within the property sector, but financial stress, as we would typically measure it, you're seeing capital inflows rather than outflows. You're seeing strong balance of payment surpluses in China right now from uh, current account surpluses and uh, capital account surpluses as well, most likely, um, which is the opposite of what you'd see on in terms of outs, absolute, absent the um, political external pressure uh, that's been underway. 
and you're seeing rates that are relatively low and fairly well, you know, fairly well behaved. So there's not that immediate evidence that this is transferring into financial stress. There is a lot more evidence that it's producing risk within the banking system. And, you know, you are seeing more evidence of bank runs, bank defaults. Um, we could see that intensify, but that is still a vulnerability that's building rather than um, evidence of an immediate acute form of stress. Lauren? Sure, I would add uh, just briefly <clears throat> on the first point there um, about the biggest difference between coming from kind of a Western framework to looking at risk in China's economy. Logan alluded to some of the kind of specific considerations going into our variable selection for the financial stress index. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think what's really the biggest differentiator in the approach overall is still this concept of, um, of the limitations of Beijing's control over certain vulnerabilities in the system. And obviously that's highly specific to China. Um, and, um, you know, while we state it uh, throughout the report, it also informs the variable selection and it, it informs kind of the crisis events. It, it, it informs the different sub indexes that we chose to include. So, you know, um, in terms of the overall approach, that's one of the ways in which um, it's highly tailored to China. Terrific, thanks. Um, I know that we're running short on time and I really appreciate everyone sticking with us, including our team at CSIS who are managing multiple events uh, and, and the audience as well. But let me turn to uh, Ken, uh, Michael and Ann in that order for some uh, initial feedback to, to these comments. Really appreciate your, your uh, insights. Okay, sir, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think the, the, on the question of um, rebalancing and boosting consumption, I think this is going to be an important priority uh, looking ahead for securing the, the recovery here. And in some sense, the, the COVID shock did highlight the fact that, you know, China does suffer from a high degree of precautionary savings reflecting a weak social safety net. And this idea that you to use fiscal stimulus most effectively by targeting to the most vulnerable households who will spend, I think still remains an open issue for, for China. On, on the financial side, I, I agree with, with Michael on the point that you know, really the key issue for China's financial system is will it support the growth that it needs uh, looking ahead? It's financial stability is one issue, whether the financial system can redirect household savings to the most productive sources of investment in the economy and spending, that still remains a very important reform agenda for, for China. Let me stop there, thanks. Michael? Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, just on this question about what's different about China and, and how do we need to change our, our thinking around China, just to sound a little bit less bullish and maybe a little bit less complacent than I may have done in my main remarks. The one thing I would say is we need to be aware of just how fast things change. You think you've got an understanding of how the system works, where the risks are, but things are evolving very, very rapidly. And I think the, the biggest mistake that we can make in terms of analyzing China and trying to understand China is assuming that things work now the way they did five years ago, because believe me, they're very different. Anne? Just, uh, you're muted. There we go. Um, I'll address the third question, which is how can we really evaluate the China's framework without having a clear understanding of our own? And I would start with the question of the money ball problem, Michael Lewis's book about the Oakland A's who managed to rank in the top two or three every season because they used predictive statistics instead of descriptive statistics. I think that what we ignore in the West and what China is working on or should be working on is the missing element in our financial modeling. We use data and we convert data to financial models. We use them directly without using the fine tools of analysis that were developed in the Cold War period and before, uh, Bayesian analysis that Ken mentioned is one of those. Without the ability to convert raw data into predictive data, we are going to have crises. We've had five, which we ignore on the assumption that our model is basically right and we have crises. If China uh, being agile, curious, competitive, and motivated to, to win, um, the financial challenge 
takes it seriously, they are developing techniques along these lines. And one of the reasons I love this paper is because it's a foray into, although you don't, you caveat it's not predictive, it's a foray into predictive analysis. And this is the direction in which all finance has to go, especially fixed income. Thank you. Uh, I know that uh, when uh, Lauren, Logan and Dan were working on this and we had the workshop at CSIS a year ago and talking to them uh, over the past several months and then reading the report, they really do try to emphasize that this is a diagnostic tool. It is not meant to be predictive. Uh, of course, uh, you don't wanna get out ahead of yourself and as good social scientists, uh, they don't wanna speak beyond their data as much as they can because of the risks in, inherent. Uh, if you do have an eye toward the future and develop some creative analytical tools and take some risks, it may give you a little more purchase uh, to be forward looking uh, than sometimes uh, we uh, want to be uh, because of, of the dangers lurking there. So I think actually, I'd, you know, from Anne's comments and some of the others and from Ken's as well, uh, just as we know China's financial system take, uh, has some risks, as scholars, we also need to take some risks even, and sometimes that puts us in, in some uncomfortable places, uh, but this report has, has really shown a path uh, to do that. I think the other thing that I would mention uh, is that uh, we've talked about a, a trade war, a tech war, a financial war. I think actually now we're also talking about risk uh, management war, uh, about who's got the better tools to understand where the risks lurk and then adopt policies uh, to address those, get around those. Uh, and, and so th that's another uh, new interesting item that uh, needs to be on the agenda. Uh, and that gets back to sort of just underlying basic governance capacity of countries, uh, the way they use experts, the tools that they use, the types of conversations uh, that they have. Uh, and you know, from a broader perspective, looking at China's political system, uh, there's a lot of political pressure top down now that limits certain kinds of debates and conversations. Um, and, but to, and, and so that you would think might limit their ability to think creatively about the financial and economic system, uh, but perhaps uh, they will find a way around that or recognize the dangers that come from, from doing so. Uh, because if you're blind, uh, you, you certainly can't engage in the type of analysis, backward looking or forward looking uh, that you need to. This has been a fantastic conversation, really tremendous report, uh, fantastic work uh, by Logan, Lauren, and Dan. Again, thank you so much, Ken, Michael, Ann. Uh, really helpful feedback and comments today. Uh, appreciate also the audience tuning in uh, and offering their comments as well. And lastly, I wanna thank uh, my team at CSIS, those on the production side that put together today's events, as well as within the trustee chair, uh, Alyssa Perez and Sherning Tan. Alyssa did a lot to shepherd the report from beginning to end to uh, get it to what it looks like on the website today, uh, as well as help with the events and Sherning as well, putting together the PowerPoint is, and other uh, tools that we need to put on an event like this. So thanks to everybody. Uh, and this conversation uh, is will stop for the moment right now and everyone get on with their day but the larger conversation is gonna continue. Thank you so much uh, and take care.